All right, welcome everybody. Just giving everybody a minute to hop on. See, we've got a number of participants already. Welcome. All right, I think we'll get started. So good afternoon and good morning to everyone joining us for today's webinar. Today, we're gonna to be talking about social media best practices, communicating the health effects of a changing climate. So we're gonna dive right in. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, a lot of great stuff during this hour, and I wanna make sure that we leave some time to answer your questions at the end, as always. This is Meg Sansevero with Marketing for Change speaking. I'm gonna start by covering a few basic housekeeping items. Uh, as a participant, you should all be on mute by default, uh, but please take this moment to double check and make sure that your mic is muted just as a courtesy to everyone on today. Give you a minute to do that. And secondly, like I said, we are planning for time at the end of this webinar for our Q&A session. So if you have a question for today's presenter, uh, before we get to that point at the end, you can type that into the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please make sure you're typing those questions for the presenter into that Q&A box and not into the chat. The chat uh, is mainly for just participants um, to chat amongst themselves. We may also be posting some links in there during the webinar. And lastly, I wanna let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded. Everyone who's on today and who has registered and possibly unable to attend will get a link to the recording uh, as well as handouts. So this is the second of six webinars that we're gonna be doing this year as part of our first ever Amplify series. This series is designed to help health officials increase their capacity to effectively communicate the public health impacts of climate change and help communities prepare and respond. It is led by the behavior change communication experts at Marketing for Change, and it's also supported through a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Climate and Health Program. So I do wanna say thank you to that team at CDC for making this learning opportunity available to everyone here as well as their partners. Uh, and big thank you to the BRACE grantees, especially the communications community of practice for doing the work that led us up to this series. All right. And today's speaker is Francis Diaz. Francis is a behavior change communication professional and social media expert at Marketing for Change. She has years of experience leveraging digital media platforms to reach audiences with tailored messages that drive action. We're so grateful to have her here with us today and she's gonna be talking through how to maximize social media for our climate health message dissemination. So Francis, I will let you take it away. Hi everyone, um, I'm really excited to be joining you today. Um, so before we get started, I just wanna take a minute to take a quick look at what we're gonna be covering in today's webinar. In this webinar, we'll go through best practices around social media strategy. We'll discuss why having a social media presence benefits your organization, how to determine your resources and processes, how to build your social media strategy, and as Meg mentioned, we're gonna have a Q&A for you guys at the end. Um, and also, uh, after the session, you will be sent a recording of this webinar, but you'll also receive some supplementary resources and handouts that will help you implement the strategies that we'll be discussing today. Um, so if you, get, if you feel kind of lost at any point, know that we'll be sending you some follow-up materials that will really help guide you through this um, and help you be able to implement your own strategies in kind of a worksheet template format. So I want to start off by saying that there is a lot that we could cover on the topic of social media practices. But today, we're just going to focus on the strategy part. Since you can find tons of information on implementation support and kind of the more logistical how-tos online. And also, one of the resources that you'll be sent as a follow-up um, from us will have some logistical guidance for you. So we have a lot we want to share with you today, um, but we want this to be an interactive and helpful session. So please feel free to type a question into the Q&A box at any time. Um, and use the chat feature only if you want to share a thought or a resource with other participants versus sending a question in for me for the Q&A session. 
So now I'm actually going to turn it over to you guys. I'd love to know what you're most interested in hearing about today. So Meg is going to launch a quick poll where you can let me know. Great, thanks everybody for participating. Seeing them all come in. Okay. All right, I think we got everybody we're gonna get. I'm gonna end the poll. Okay, great. So it looks like you guys are most interested in figuring out uh, how to build your social media strategy. Um, so we'll try to spend a little extra time there. Um, that's kind of where I planned on spending the bulk of the webinar anyway, um, since uh, that's normally uh, the part that uh, people are most interested in. Um, but if there's anything that I don't cover in either any of the other sections or in the strategy section, then again, feel free to put it into the Q&A box. So we'll start by talking a little bit about why having a social media presence benefits your organization. So we don't have to tell you that social media is useful and that it's a great way to reach people. I mean, why else would you be taking an hour out of your day to watch this webinar? So the real question is, why would you as a public health professional spend your time there? Well, there are a couple of ways that having a social media presence is uniquely beneficial to you. So first, social media can assist in bridging the gap between the government and the public by increasing citizen engagement through public participation and broader engagement and engaging citizens in public matters. And also social media allows public entities to be more accessible and transparent to the public itself. Um, and it makes citizens feel like every individual voice can be heard when they have a way to access public entities directly, whether that be uh, a person or an organization. And an effective social platform can also serve as a robust outreach tool. Public campaigns and initiatives reach more citizens through social media than most other methods, since it's a place that citizens are already gathered and engaged. And social media also provides an easier way to disseminate information to the public quickly and effectively in a time of crisis. This is especially true in safety related information efforts to keep people informed before, during, and after emergencies or urgent events. Um, a lot of times whenever an emergency situation is occurring, if there's a hurricane or a natural disaster, uh, people are checking social media really regularly because they know that if there is um, new up-to-date information, then that's where organizations are going to most likely be posting it. So know that um, if there is kind of a crisis, that that's where people are already assuming that you're going to be uh, posting that information. So it's a good place to make sure that you're doing that. And also, um, you can also, uh, both through paid media and organically, specifically target people um, who you need to reach with your message um, easier and more effectively on social. And lastly, real-time data can be collected and tracked online to understand the feelings of citizens. And once you understand the landscape around what's happening and how the public feels about your issue, you can make informed decisions around messaging and outreach strategies. You can also assess the reach of your programs and the overall effectiveness by looking at how audiences are engaging with your content. So now that we've kind of touched on all the ways that having a social media presence can be beneficial to your organization, we're going to discuss how you can determine what you're able to invest in your social media efforts. So we understand that a good portion of the audience joining this webinar today is working in a situation where you don't directly run your organization's social media account. So before we talk too much more about process, I'd love to know how many of you do have direct access to your program's social media accounts versus how many of you have to submit content to a social media manager, just so I have a better sense of where you guys are at. So Meg is gonna launch another quick poll where you can let me know. And the poll is launched. All 
All right, last chance, everybody get your votes in. Got some interesting results here. Okay, I'm gonna end it. Okay, so we are pretty split. Um, that's really interesting, but that's good to know. Um, so right now, I actually wanna talk a little bit more to the people who have to submit content through a review process. So if you're one of the about 50% um, who gets to review and post content, then this particular section really quickly isn't so much for you, uh, but you may wanna be thinking through how you can make it easier for others in your organization to get content to you or be thinking about how you can use others in your organization to help you with content development. I know as someone who creates content for my own organization, I know how much easier it makes my job um, when I have different people with um, help me create content. And not only does different people with different expertise also mean diversity in ideas and creativity, um, but you know, it also makes you know, the process a lot easier. So you're diversifying your content and that likely is going to lead to more interesting content for your audience. So now I'm gonna switch uh, back to the group who has to submit content for review um, and talk to you guys a little bit. So I know that having to go through a formal approval process kind of puts you in a weird space. You're using a platform that's meant to communicate in the moment, but you're having to write and plan and send content for approval sometimes weeks in advance. And it may seem frustrating to be working in these parameters, but that just means that we need to work hard, plan ahead, and collaborate with your organization's social media manager. If there is anyone who understands this predicament of balancing relevant and fresh content between needing to plan ahead and develop substantive content, it is them. So they're likely to work with you on this. So I want to kind of go through a few ways to make this easier. First, Make sure you understand all aspects of your approval process at the onset of planning. So figure out who's responsible for posting social media content to your organization. How far in advance do you need to send them content? Who all needs to review or approve the content before it gets posted? And then what channels and format does it need to be submitted in? The best way to make sure that you're able to get your organization, organization or department represented on social media is to ask a ton of questions and see how you can make the social media manager's job easier. Ask them what kind of content they're looking for and what you can do to improve the content that you've submitted so that it's more likely to get approved faster in the future. And it will make your job easier if they feel like you're trying to make their life easier. So it's easy when you're kind of going through social media um, and you see large corporate or NGO social media accounts and you think, that's awesome. We should be doing that. Our content should look like that content. We should be engaging in that way. Um, and while it's really great to get inspiration from corporate entities social media efforts, and oftentimes that can sometimes help you keep a pulse on the kinds of content that performs well since they have teams that really do a lot of research to see what their audiences are looking for. It's important to keep in mind that corporations and large organizations are not one or two man or woman teams. They're creating relevant, engaging, high production value content for every social media platform all on their own. They have entire teams of people working on their social efforts as their full-time jobs. So you cannot do it all, but that's okay. It's important to identify what you can do and then do those things very well. So here's how you can do that. First, define the resources that are available to you. Ask yourself, how many, how many people have the time and capacity to spend time on social media? How much time can be devoted to social media each week? What are the skill sets of the people who will be creating this content? Are they great writers? Are they visually creative? Are they great at explaining complex issues and topics? Identify what your team's strengths are to determine the kinds of content that you can create really well. And then create a group of people who will commit to social media roles. And determining this will help you set up roles and responsibilities, which is the next part of this, of which um, you need to clearly define uh, the roles in your organization when it comes to social media content creation, planning, and analytics. 
So assign clear roles and responsibilities um, will help you keep up an effective social media presence. Think through who's going to be creating the content for social media. Who's in charge of monitoring your social media presence? Who's in charge of asking for clearance? Do they have the skills and time to do this? Some people on your team may take up more than one role, and that's okay, as long as that person is committed to doing that um, and on a regular basis. So this can help you set guidelines and expectations for how frequently to post, how often to monitor your platforms, and how quickly you're able to, in, uh, to respond to interactions from your online audience to make sure that this doesn't fall through the cracks. You do not have to post every day, but make sure that you set aside enough time and resources to make sure that you can be consistent with your content. So if you can only post twice a week, make sure that you're reliable in that so that your audience knows what they can be expecting from you. So once you determine your resources and roles, you can begin developing a social media strategy based on what you know your team is capable of realistically delivering. So this is where we'll spend most of our discussion today. And this is also the topic that you guys are most interested in. So that works out well. Um, there's a lot to kind of go through here. So we're going to walk through it pretty quickly. Um, but after this webinar, one of the handouts you'll be sent is a strategy template. And the handout mirrors what we're going to be talking about in this webinar. And it'll help you think through um, and fill out the template with your own strategies. So there is an old advertising adage. When you reach everyone, you reach no one. So the temptation and pressure you'll face from the beginning is to tell your whole story to as many people as possible with your messaging. And while you do have a big group of people to reach, uh, what we're talking about specifically here is who you're talking to on social media. So figuring out who is most likely to engage with you and who do you think you'll have the greatest chance to move into behavior change. So determining who your audience is and what you want them to do. Imagine this person as you're writing your social media content. When you're figuring out your audience, it helps to get very specific and develop a persona. Give this person a name, decide what type of job they would likely have, think through what their daily life looks like, and at what point they'd be interacting with your content. Think through the kinds of needs, wants, and challenges that this person could have in their life. Getting this granular when developing your persona will help you develop better, more tailored content to your most likely audience. So now that you know, or once you figure out who you're talking to, then you need to determine the best tone to speak to your audience. So for example, if your audience is low income moms, you'll want your voice to be empathetic, conversational, and use plain language. But if your audience is community partners, your tone may need to be a little bit more collaborative and authoritative. When you're writing your voice and language guidelines, it helps to picture that persona that we talked about from your audience and think about the unique place in life that that person finds themselves. When you're deciding your brand or program's voice, think about how to speak directly to that person in a way that resonates and is comfortable. Then write about your organization as if it were a person too. If your program or brand was a person, what would they be like and how would they communicate with others? Make sure that once you choose and develop the qualities of your voice, you are consistent across any platforms that you have. And make sure that anyone who's in charge of creating content with you knows how to use this voice as well. It helps to develop a document that provides guidance on your organization's voice to keep it consistent across writers and establish your official stance and language around various issues. When you're developing this document, it's helpful to make a list of adjectives that your organization's voice is and a list of adjectives that your organization is not. Also, try writing a couple of example sentences to demonstrate what that voice looks like when it's written out. And again, on the template that we'll send you afterwards, there's a section that kind of walks you through how to do that. But as you're doing this exercise, check to see if your organization has a brand guide document that has some guidelines about how the organization speaks to, about itself. And if you're not sure if that document exists, then check with the communications team and they can let you know. So based on your capacity, 
um, or the capacity of your resources and your target audience, you'll want to narrow down to the social media platforms that would be most effective and efficient for your organization. As I mentioned before, you want to make sure that anywhere where you have a presence, you're able to develop content well. So it doesn't serve you to be developing content for a platform that isn't ideal for your audience and organization. The main thing to ask when determining this is where is your audience at already? The platforms with the broadest reach are Facebook and Twitter. Most people from the millennial age range and up have accounts on those platforms. But then if you want to target professionals and thought leaders, Twitter and LinkedIn would likely be the best platform for you. And if you're targeting, if your target audience is youth, so under 18 and up into like the mid 20s, um, Instagram and Snapchat would be your best chance at reaching them. It's also important to ask and identify what are your skills. Do you have the ability to make highly visual content? If you do, then Instagram and Snapchat are a good fit. If content and conversations are more your speed, then Twitter and Facebook are better. And LinkedIn is best for long form content related to industry, business, and career. So often one of the questions that uh, we get most around platforms is how to know which one is right for you. So I'm gonna kind of go through each one in a little bit more detail um, and hopefully that's helpful um, in, you know, as you're assessing which platform your organization should be on. So Twitter is 280 characters of potential. While content is short, Twitter takes a good time commitment to share often enough to stay at the top of people's feeds. The half-life of a tweet is only about 18 minutes before it gets buried in all the other tweets. So it is something that you do have to post on a little bit more regularly in order to make sure that people are seeing that content. So Twitter has great potential for campaigns, connecting with the media, thought leaders and policymakers. It's an excellent tool to frame your brand as part of the national conversation surrounding your area of expertise. Um, you can spend some time searching feeds of similar brands or relevant thought leaders on Twitter to find regularly used hashtags to incorporate into your tweets. It's also a great place to showcase, highlight, and honor your members, customers, or partners um, by retweeting them and engaging with them. Uh, and you can also celebrate the work of your staff, members, or partners. Because you do have to post more often, um, there's kind of more things, there are more options for you to post about. And then LinkedIn can require less frequent posting than other channels, and it's a great way to reach other professionals. As a platform in general, it's a little bit more buttoned up than Facebook or Twitter, um, and it has a lot less bells and whistles. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. LinkedIn can be a lot easier of a platform for an organization to master as a company um, because it is a little bit more straightforward and you don't have to post about it or you don't have to post on it as often. Instagram on the, end, on, the, on the opposite of that is it does require a bit of an investment in terms of time and creativity. People who are on LinkedIn or sorry, on Instagram don't come to see flyers or announcements. They come to see really good pictures. So if you have a staff member with a creative eye who knows around, oh, their way around a photo editing app, um, then maybe they're the person to include uh, if you're thinking about going onto Instagram to help you with content planning and management. And then lastly, Facebook, uh, even despite the recent controversies, is still the epicenter of social media for the majority of people. Uh, if you don't already have one, uh, you can create a Facebook page for your brand and invite your audience to like you. Um, start with personal friends and organizations that you're already working with, and then you can kind of spread out from there to develop your fan base. Um, but keep in mind that uh, nowadays, to be truly successful in today's Facebook algorithm, it's best to have a budget for Facebook advertising. And that's because about a year ago now, uh, Facebook made a pretty huge change uh, in its algorithm that prioritizes content from a user's friends and family and demotes content from brands and organizations. So I wanna be really clear that I don't think it's impossible to be successful on Facebook now without, I mean, I don't think that it's impossible to be, on, to be successful on Facebook without just doing paid advertising, um, but most successful strategies do utilize a mix of paid content with really good and engaging organic content. 
Um, a lot of people, especially millennials, will use Facebook kind of like an organization's landing page. So even before they check out your website, they'll search Facebook to see what kind of content your organization is posting or find out a little bit more about it because they're assuming that anything that's really important or relevant would be posted there for them to see. So in most cases, Facebook is probably going to be a platform that your organization uses, at least in some capacity. So once you've determined your audience voice and platforms, you can begin outlining the kinds of content and topic areas that you want to post about on social. Think about the kinds of content that would be most relevant coming from your organization and also what does your audience really need to know and what, what would they be interested in? These are good questions for you to start thinking of as you're developing content. For example, when we created a social media toolkit with CDC, we lined up content topics with relevant seasons and nationally acknowledged days and coordinated hashtags. This way we could make sure that climate health messaging was being incorporated into a larger national conversation that were already happening on social media. So you can do a search on each platform that you plan to post on for relevant hashtags for your organization or industry and see which hashtags already have a lot of conversation happening around them so that you can expand the reach of your content when you utilize that in your post. So I wanna pause for a minute to talk about what typically occupies a person's mind who is not thinking about climate health. So your audience is busy and they already have a lot that preoccupies their minds. They could be thinking about highlights from the Oscars, the honey do list waiting for them at home, the fact that their spouse's birthday is coming up and they still don't have a gift, what they're gonna have for lunch today, or literally any of the number of endless things that just occupy our brains on a daily basis. So they're not looking for one more thing to worry about. And then on top of that, not only do they have a lot on their minds already, but they're also being bombarded with alerts, calls, text, calendar notifications, breaking news updates, and all of the messages and behaviors that other organizations want them to take. So when you're developing your social media content, think about what will actually be interesting or helpful to your audience. So don't lecture them. Before you ask your audience to do something or share something with them, ask what's in it for them. Make sure the information is helpful and interesting to your audience. And put yourself in their shoes. We're all told things that we don't care that much about all the time. You want to make sure that your content doesn't fall into that category for your audience. When you share information with your audience, focus on salience. What's unique about the message that you're sharing? To determine if your audience would be interested in the information, think about what people talk about within your social circles, people who don't work in your field. And then find ways to use angles of relevance and timeliness with your content strategies. And then when you do post, only give your audience one behavior at a time in a post. So each post should have some sort of action that you want your audience to take, even if it's just going to the website. But when you're thinking about this and your behaviors, keep in mind that a behavior is an observable action. So learning something new or raising awareness does not count as a behavior. If you have multiple behaviors, maybe even around one issue that you want your audience to take, then you can turn that into a series of posts with each, each behavior getting its own post. So one post, one behavior. I know I'm really hanging out on this point, but it's an important one to keep your audience from getting overwhelmed and tuning you out. Another way to help you break through the clutter is to make sure that you're always including some sort of visual with your post. Research shows that posts that include images produce 650% higher engagement rates than text only posts. So even if it's not, you know, a really high production image, any image is better than no image. And then lastly, even if you get it right and your content resonates with your audience, you cannot plan for virality. If you get lucky, or in some cases, unlucky, your video or your content can go viral. But that is something that's totally outside of your control. So as we previously mentioned, 
One of the key benefits to social media is increased engagement from citizens. So if you have their attention, it's important to engage with them. If they reply to you or ask a relevant question, hit that reply button, like their post, etc. Maybe this could even mean asking your audience a question at the end of one of your posts to encourage engagement and discussion. This kind of audience engagement can make people feel heard and appreciated, which will bring you closer to your community. And not to mention, it makes public entities feel more connected and accessible to the public, which is a huge plus. So I know I talked about it a little bit with Facebook before, um, but I also want to note here when we're talking about audience engagement, that when audiences are engaging with your content, the algorithms of the platforms, not just Facebook, all of the platforms, um, they see that and they take it to mean that your organization is posting content that's relevant and interesting to its users. So they're going to reward that by displaying your content towards the top of people's feeds. So if no one is engaging with your content, then the algorithms on these platforms are going to see that and take it to mean that users are not interested in your content. And it's going to push your content towards the bottom of people's feeds. So the problem with that is that you'll be continuously creating and posting content that no one is seeing so they can't engage in it. So it kind of puts you in kind of a catch-22 situation. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, it's really to your best interest that um, people find your content engaging and really thinking about what's interesting and useful to your audience. So, I mean, the reason why platforms do this is because they're, I mean, they're businesses. So they're trying to keep users on their platform and engaged as long as possible. So they're gonna do what they need to do to make sure that, that happens. So hence the algorithms. And don't be afraid to have conversations with your audience. You may be able to help them in a way that you didn't expect. Your partners are already your allies, so why not make them connections? Find all of your partners on social media and follow them. And hopefully they'll follow you back. If you already do this, then that's awesome. Now, once you follow them, notice what kind of content they post and then see if there's anything that you think would be relevant to share with your own audience. Not only will this provide relevant content and information to your followers, it will also make your partners notice you and they'll be more likely to share your content in the future, which is a win for everyone. So that being said, engaging with your partners um, is important. So once you've found and followed them, engage with them. Like some of their posts, share their content, retweet them. All of these actions will create a symbiotic relationship in the, in the social media space. And so I know about half of you are not in control of the day-to-day -day managing of your accounts. So if this is the case for you, um, you can give a list of your partners to your social media manager and ask them to follow those accounts. You can also check out what your partners are doing from your personal social media accounts and then send links of the posts that you think would be valuable to share um, from your partner organization page. You can send that to your social media manager. Um, and you can also just see what your partners are posting and use that as inspiration for content creation. If you see that there's a series of posts that they're doing or a type of you know, way that they're talking to their audience or graphics that they're using, um, you can use that for inspiration as you're thinking about how you can create your own content, especially if you guys have similar audiences. So you never know for sure what, will, what your audience is going to respond to and what will drive their engagement until you test it and see what results you get. Developing social media content and creating the pages and platforms themselves is not a build it and they will come. It's an iterative process. So use the social media platforms analytics, uh, or you can also uh, use a third party analytics service if that's in your budget, or you can kind of simply just use your own eye to observe what types of content your audience is engaging with on a regular basis. I will say that every social media platform does have an analytics tab in the administration section of the page. So I would definitely recommend looking there first um, and kind of it'll give you a breakdown of how each one of your posts are performing. So social media optimization is simply just tweaking your content and your strategy to maximize the reach and help you connect more with your audience. So look, some things to look for are, you know, do your posts with hashtags get the most reach? Are your shorter posts being shared more? Does content with images or videos get the most comments or shares? 
find out what posts um, are getting the most comments and shares and likes, um, and then see what qualities those posts have that maybe you can keep emulating in the future. So these are all examples of what you can look for when you're optimizing your social media content. And then in addition to content, those analytics can also tell you when your particular audience is online. And that can give you a better idea of when to post to make sure that you're getting it in front of as many people as possible. I know it's easy to get overwhelmed with analytics that you're not familiar with and platforms that change frequently. Um, but go back to your original goal in posting. Whether you're trying to engage your audience or drive traffic to your website, you want to check uh, if your posts are achieving these goals. And then once you find these little trends in your content, you can optimize your strategy based on what's working and what's not. And remembering that this is an iterative process and you should always be evaluating and adjusting. Okay. Hi, this is Meg again. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, we are right on time. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, we've got plenty of time to answer questions and have a little discussion. Uh, I see a few questions in the Q&A already. So as everybody's digesting Oh, all of that great information that you just talked about, please go ahead uh, and type into the Q&A. Um, I've already seen some great questions there. Um, so, so please go ahead and use that feature. Uh, we'll do what we can to cover everything. Um, and as you're typing in those questions and thinking about what else you might want to know, uh, I just want to remind you, as Francis said, you're going to be receiving access to a couple of really great handouts, one of them being more of a supplemental tip sheet covering some of what Francis talked about today in a little bit more uh, in, in sort of a summary form, as well as an editorial planning worksheet. So please do take advantage of those. Uh, I believe I have a colleague who will also be posting uh, a link to those in the chat, um, but remember you'll also be getting them via email. Okay. Great. So, uh, Francis, I have a, a couple of my own questions uh, to start, and then I'll, I'll hop in to answer the questions I see in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of planning that goes <laughs> clearly into, into social media uh, strategy and, um, you know, planning, optimizing, looking at analytics. Um, I guess in particular um, on the planning side and thinking about those editorial calendars, uh, are there any helpful tools um, that people might want to know about for setting up uh, those calendars? Yes, so there are a lot um, of softwares and resources that exist online. Um, so there's a couple of different types of content planning. So there is creating an editorial content calendar. And so that's where you look at the different topics um, and the timings of posts that you'll do throughout a given time. Um, and so what I use um, and what I find is helpful is if you go to the national, um, you kind of create a document, if you go and find national holidays, so um, those are both uh, government holidays and then also just nationally recognized days or public health months, um, you can, there's a lot of websites out there that list when those are. Um, and then if you have a copy of that, you know when you can kind of plan, you can match your content to when those days are um, to just use those hashtags and maximize the reach. So, um, and then also just planning out what your content topics are into your editorial calendar. Uh, and so then that's kind of your topic planning, but then to actually plan out uh, your post in terms of a calendar of on this day, I'll post this. Um, there are a couple of different tools out there. Um, I know Hootsuite is a really popular one that people use. Um, there is a free version and also an upgraded version. Um, obviously on the free version, the functionalities are a little bit limited, um, but you can link your social media accounts to that platform and then you can put your post in there and schedule them so that it will publish automatically for you. Um, but what I use is really just a spreadsheet. Um, and so I have a column for each one of the platforms. Um, and then uh, I know which, what content I'll post on each day. Um, and I do that because what you, 
you don't really want to just copy and paste content um, so that it's exactly the same from one platform to the, to the next. Because um, as I mentioned a little bit, I think I touched on it just once, the tone is going to be a little bit different. So like um, on Facebook, it's going to be a little bit more, um, you know, kind of here are the facts, um, but a little bit playful with a graphic. Twitter is going to be shorter, really utilizing a lot of hashtags, figuring out how you can tap into conversations that are already happening. Um, and LinkedIn is a little bit more buttoned up. Um, so I'd kind of take more of a business angle there. So you want to make sure your content is tailored to the platform so that it does perform well there. Um, so what I found really helpful in planning content is just putting it into a spreadsheet so that I can see all of the content on each platform for each day. Um, and then there are scheduling. So within Facebook, you can actually schedule the post within the platform itself. So when you go to put a post in and then you hit publish, it'll drop down and you can select schedule. So that's helpful. Um, so then if you find out, you know, through your analytics that your audience is primarily online at night, you probably don't want to be doing that after work hours. So you can schedule the post to post automatically during those hours that you know your audience is online. Um, and then there are other services that can help you do that for other platforms um, like Hootsuite or Buffer. Um, there are a lot out there that can help you in terms of scheduling. Awesome. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, I know we love the the spreadsheet and the schedulers. Those are those are just a real lifesaver. Um, because, you know, of course, not all of us are going to be on social media all the time. But thanks for sharing. Great. Okay, I'm seeing a lot more questions in the q and a so I'm going to jump uh, over to those. Um, Mary Beth uh, is asking uh, how do you search hashtags? Should hashtags be used for all social media or just Twitter? That's, That's a great, great question. question. Um, so, I so there are different ways you can do it. So you can use hashtags on all platforms is the short answer to that question. Um, but there are best practices into how to utilize those hashtags. Um, so with Twitter, you can actually, uh, the best practice is to use no more than three in one tweet. Uh, and then you can use hashtags in the body of the post. So you can change the copy of the post itself to include a hashtag in it. Whereas for the other platforms, it's best to add hashtags at the end after a couple of spaces. So you have your uninterrupted post copy that's all just plain text and then you add the hashtags at the bottom. Um, and that's just uh, the preferred viewing user experience of the audiences of the different platforms. And partially it's because that's what they've come to expect. Um, in terms of figuring out which hashtags are best, um, you can just do a little bit of internet research. So if, you're, um, if your topic is climate health, um, then you can type in various um, versions of that into the search bar in Twitter. You can do hashtag climate health, hashtag climate, hashtag health, hashtag whatever, um, and then see what types of conversations, because it's not just the most conversations, you want to make sure you're tapping into relevant conversations also. Um, so then when you search that into Twitter, you can see the kinds of conversations that are coming up and who's talking about that. Um, also, if you know that there's another organization who's talking about a similar issue, um, you can just go to their profile and see how they're talking about it too. Um, and you can also do a Google search. Um, a lot of times there are content banks and if it's a really popular topic, um, then there's someone who's already gathered that for you so you can check there too. Right. Okay. And do hashtags, Francis, do they have, um, do they have a life outside of Twitter? Do you recommend using them in other like specific platforms? Yes. So you can use them on all, uh, so Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram all also utilize hashtags. Um, but again, like I mentioned before, you just want to make sure that you're adding them to the end of the post copy and not embedding them in the post copy. So it'll be post copy and then a space or two, and then you put the hashtag. Um, but yes, now, uh, originally, Facebook or hashtags were just for Twitter, but they have expanded beyond that. And now they're on all of the different platforms. Um, they're just utilized a little differently. Good questions. Great. Got it. 
Okay. Um, Sarah has a question, uh, I think, uh, related to uh, your discussion around how to get noticed uh, on these platforms uh, in, in the crowded space uh, that we're in today. So she's asking, what is the best length for videos on social? And can you explain again why the content tends to get pushed down, uh, depending on how engaging it is? It's a great question, Sarah. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so video length uh, depends on each platform, um, but video does perform best. Um, so I mentioned that uh, posts with images have a 650% higher engagement rate. Um, ones or posts with videos are even a little bit higher than that. Um, so each platform has kind of its, I guess, best practices in terms of video. Um, so for Facebook, the ideal video length is between five, three to five minutes to keep people watching. Um, for LinkedIn, it's 30 seconds. Um, sorry, I have it written down because I had a feeling someone asked that question. Um, and then Twitter, it's about this. So Twitter actually has a cap. You can't post more than a two minute video on Twitter organically. Um, and side note, I would recommend that you're posting these videos organically instead of sharing a link to YouTube or Vimeo. And the reason why that is, is so that they autoplay, um, so that as users are, or audiences are scrolling through, uh, when they get to that video, it will automatically pit, uh, play. And then um, I would also recommend if you're utilizing video that you add in captions because most people view videos on mute. Uh, and they don't turn the sound on. So you want to make sure that you add captions into your video files. Um, I know Facebook makes that really easy to do um, in their video editing. Um, but with Twitter, you'll need to upload a file that already has those captions there. Um, and then in terms of the algorithms uh, demoting pages, um, basically what that is, is it just uh, the platforms, have, for Facebook specifically, um, Facebook has realized that people are more interested in other people, and that's normally the case than they are uh, with brands or organizations. So they want to try and prioritize content that you are um, interested in. And so what all the platforms do is they see what kinds of content you are engaging with as a particular user, um, and then they'll serve you more content like that. So if there's a particular person that you always like their post, um, you're always kind of clicking on stuff that they share, then they're going to prioritize that person's content to you specifically. So it's really tailored to the individual user to try and keep these individual users on the platform for as long as possible. So what you need to do is um, just kind of see, try and publish things that get a lot of engagement. Um, ask your, ask uh, Facebook especially really prioritizes uh, conversations and discussions. Um, so if you can post content that really um, tries to elicit conversations and discussions among your audience, maybe if you ask them a question um, or if you um, live videos are really good with that. Live videos tend to get a lot of comments and engagement. Um, so if you do like Facebook lives, um, Instagram lives, um, then that's a good way to do that too, um, to get that engagement. But it's really about, uh, and. So when I say engagement, uh, a while ago, there was um, something called engagement baiting that a lot of pages were doing to try and work around the algorithm um, to try and get their content you know, shown higher. And that's when uh, they would post something and they would say like, comment with this emoji if you, know, you agree or you know, comment this you know, if you have a friend that does this, whatever. They're, tr they're trying to get you to write in the comments or to like something um, based on like a response to the post um, and that's called engagement baiting. So the con the discussions that were happening in those comments were not real discussions and so the platform saw that and so now they demote that. So you don't want to engagement bait, you don't want to do that, you want to try and have real discussions. So the best way to do that is to ask a question or to ask um, not even, maybe not a question, but ask what their experiences are. Ask the, your participants to share their stories. Um, and a lot of times people are really willing to do that because they like to talk about themselves. Yeah, thanks, Francis. Love that. It's like, you know, I think sometimes when we're posting as a brand or organization, sometimes it's easy for us to get caught up in sort of 
being in that more professional space, but I think what I'm hearing from you is just kind of, you know, stay in the conversational space, sort of be yourself, talk like a person. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, great. Yeah. And, and as far as videos, I just want to reiterate, I heard, you know, length, it's shorter generally, but also depends on the platform and also making sure that you're uploading those directly to the platform and not and not linking off to YouTube or something else. Right. Okay. Thank you for that thorough answer. All right. Morgan has a great one. Uh, so about infographics, how and when are infographics most effective? When is it most applicable, applicable sorry, to use an infographic versus a traditional photo? Uh, do you have any good resources for creating infographic content? All right. So Great. yeah, we'll start with the, yeah, how yeah. and when, when they're most effective. Great question. Um, so I'd say anytime you want, anytime it's important to you uh, to share uh, statistics or numerical information, um, I know that a lot of times as researchers, that's kind of where we go. Um, but when you really know that um, a story is not the best way to do it, it's really this numerical information that's going to hit home, um, then that's when you would use an infographic over a photo. If it's something that you, if it's a subject matter that you can break down um, in a story form, um, then I would probably usually recommend that. Um, just because it's easier to digest and people like stories, um, then you would use, you know, a post with a bit, you know, with a picture. Um, but if it's numerical, then you can go the infographic route. Um, and uh, infographics work on all platforms. Um, as people really like, especially if it's um, kind of a complex subject that you've made really digestible because it makes them feel smart. Um, you're able to kind of break down a really complex thing into a under, an easy to understand uh, kind of piece of content and information. So uh, one resource to do this, there are a couple online. Um, Canva is a really good one for creating graphics in general. Um, in terms of the really, so when you think of like a really good infographic, there's not really a free resource I can think of um, to do that. It's really a graphic designer has to do that because a lot of thought has to go into um, how you're conveying that information and the visuals that you're using to kind of, it's still a story and to kind of share that story. Um, so for really brief ones um, that maybe don't have a ton of complex information, then Canva is a really good resource. Um, if it is a little bit more complex, um, or a lot more complex, then probably you'll need a design team to kind of uh, hash that out. Great. I love it. I see some other folks are sharing resources that they, they prefer to use, so that's awesome. Okay, so uh, the next question I'm going to go to is a little bit answering um, a few people uh, asking about something similar. So um, when we're worried uh, about um, maybe the topic or subject matter, whoever are posting uh, might invoke some trolling or negative comments. Uh, so, you know, there, there are cases um, in particular here where we might be worried about that. Um, some folks know partners who are worried about that kind of thing. Um, looks like smartly they're encouraging them to have a comment policy that is public uh, around that, but anything um, you can offer Francis about um, the best way to approach that, you know, potential for, for negative or unwanted comments um, in the social media space be helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it seems like it's something that we hear about a lot. The internet trolls are pretty notorious at this point. Um, so I think the main thing is when your post starting from definitely have a comment policy um, that should be part of your um, when you're determining your you know, your capacity and your roles and responsibilities um, you should be figuring out um, who can respond to people because it is really important if you are getting people who are responding to your content it's really important that you're able to respond back to them and engage them in those conversations because that also you know boosts the algorithm and then it also just builds a relationship with your audience, which is really important. So it is really, I definitely agree, whoever, you know, put that tip out there, that you should have a public comment policy um, and you should be checking in on those uh, pretty regularly. 
But on the content creation part of it, I think the biggest thing is um, when, you're po- when you're thinking about posting something that could be controversial, um, really approaching it from a place of empathy. Um, so making sure that your tone isn't, if you are posting something controversial, um, that it doesn't come off as insensitive or judgmental. Um, it's really empathetic, but still true and accurate. Um, and then that might kind of temper down people who feel offended by that comment um, or that kind of content that you're posting. Um, and then in terms of actually handling the comments themselves, um, I'm pretty hands-off when it comes to censorship. Um, I, my personal approach to the accounts that I manage is unless it is threatening or blatantly explicit, I let it be. Um, and then we make a decision on whether or not if someone is just, you know, posting, you know, not nice things and they're not really um, kind of adding anything to the conversation, then I think that's probably someone that you can just ignore. But if someone is posting um, either, you know, they're responding and they're, you know, they disagree with what you're saying or they're reiterating a myth that's not true about the thing that you are, you know, talking about that's maybe a little controversial, then definitely take the opportunity to engage them um, in an empathetic way that kind of, you know, doesn't further enrage them. But it's really important when you are responding to kind of sensitive things that you don't reiterate the myth. Um, so uh, the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head is uh, vaccinations, um, probably because we're talking about public health. Um, so if someone posts something about vaccines, then someone comments something that's not true uh, scientifically about uh, vaccines and what they may cause, then you would respond to them. But you would want you would want to be really careful that you didn't respond in a way that reiterates the myth. So you don't want to restate that um, and give any validity to that. You only want to state truths. Um, so you know, actually, science shows that you know blank um, instead of even engaging with the content that's not true. Um, just because when people see that, uh, they just they just further entrench and you've kind of given validity to this, you know, false statement. Got it. Those are some really helpful tips, Francis. And I know we've seen before uh, in, in comment threads where actually the community itself has sort of uh, jumped in and kind of self-corrected um, on, on things like that. So that's, mm-hmm. that's also a cool thing to be able to see on social media. Yeah. Um, great. There's a couple of more technical questions that we can run a few minutes over. I totally understand uh, if folks uh, have somewhere to be at the top of the hour, um, but there's a few questions I'd love to sneak in here. Uh, so Amelia is asking, are QR codes still relevant to use in social media posts and or uh, also on physical posters? Some people use them. Have they been phased out or are they no longer being used? So that's a great question. Um, so they went away for a little while um, and they still haven't totally made a comeback, but I think that they're on the ups um, because new camera technology now, so the barrier to QR codes before was that you had to download a different app. And anytime you are asking users to download an app, there's a little bit of a barrier there. But now some cameras are able to detect QR codes uh, through the camera f- feature um, and then take them to that. Uh, website. Uh, So my prediction is that they're on the ups, but they're not really something that a lot of people use right now. Still probably the best thing to do, especially on, um, so if it's an offline, it's a flyer, um, I would really recommend using a URL with a vanity or um, something that kind of tags it so that you know that someone came in through that flyer. So um, I don't know if it's like www.climatehealth slash, and then something very particular. So if someone were to type in that URL, you know that you captured them from the flyer. So you're able to test the effectiveness of that particular tool. Um, So still QR codes aren't totally mainstream again yet. Um, So I don't know if that's helpful response. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, we won't hold you to it, but I like, I like the idea of, you know, making sure you can evaluate it for sure. Uh, great. Okay. So Elena is asking, is there a copyright concern when it comes to posting images found online or does social media have its own copyright rules for that kind of thing using images? Great question. Um, yes, I think it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, when you are searching for images on the internet, 
Um, if you go to Google, you can filter by um, images that are allowed for reuse. Um, and then that's always going to be your safest bet um, to be able to download those images that, you know, there is no copyright associated with it. Um, but copy, I mean, if it's, you're promoting content as your own, um, that's always a risk, unless the exception to that is if you are posting a link. So when you put a link into a social media platform, it will auto-populate with an image and a headline and um, a little, like, subhead blurb. So if you, if that's pulled in automatically, then um, that's what they want to happen. But if you are actually downloading an image and sharing it on social, I would make sure that it's... Uh, it's a uh, license for reuse. Great, got it. Like you said, better be safe than sorry. Um, okay, uh, before I wrap up, I just wanna address one question that Grace had um, that I think uh, is, is gonna come in handy um, for an upcoming webinar. So Grace asks, what's the best strategy to grow your network, particularly with community members? Sounds like they have a strong base, but would like to engage with them more. Uh, Grace, I just wanna uh, make a plug for the Ally Acquisition webinar that I believe is in June. Um, don't hold me to that, but it's, it's, on, it's on the list of six. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, attending that uh, is gonna be really helpful when you think about uh, how to approach growing your network. Uh, but Francis, if you have anything to add as far as doing that on social media in particular, uh, certainly feel free to jump in there. Yeah, I think just uh, engaging. So if you know um, that there are other organizations um, that are doing similar work uh, or work that you know, you're trying to expand your group in, then definitely following them and engaging them. Um, and hopefully they will, sh if you share their content, they're likely to share your content also, um, which means that your content would be getting in front of their active members. Um, and also social media groups are a really good way to do that. Um, you can do that on LinkedIn and Facebook, create a group. Um, and so that's kind of a more exclusive way. And um, the algorithms don't apply uh, to that. So if you do have people who are, you know, trying to get into your group or in your group and you're posting content to them, then they are going to see it. So it's an easier uh, way to kind of um, get people, get your content in front of people. And if you can incentivize being in that group somehow, so either they, you know, receive something if they join, um, or there's like a special, you know, some sort of exclusive special offer, um, then you may be more likely to get people to, you know, get in there. Great. Thanks for adding that. All right. Well, thank you all for hanging in there. I know we went over time, but there were some really amazing questions. I just wanted to make sure we were answer to Abel's able to answer as many as possible. Uh, so uh, what's coming next? This was our second webinar in the series. Um, and I hope that you'll take a couple minutes to respond to the very short feedback questionnaire uh, that you should see when you close out of this webinar, but you will also get a link uh, in the follow up email that is coming to you in the next day. Uh, so please uh, sign up for the rest of the webinars. The next one is April 18th. We're going to be skipping March uh, because there is a grantee meeting during that time. Uh, so the next one is with Rob Gould on public outreach and dissemination. Uh, and if you have not registered already, you will see a link to do that in the follow-up email. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Francis, and we'll see you next time.